It was June 20th, 1810. Priscilla Queen and Mina Queen arrived at the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. Both women had sued slaveholders for their freedom. Priscilla Queen sued the Reverend Francis Neal. He was president of Georgetown College, now university. And Mina Queen had sued John Hepburn. He had squandered his immense inheritance in Europe gone bankrupt and would fight tooth and nail to reclaim his wealth and his social standing. The trial would decide if the queens would remain enslaved or if they would be declared free. Whatever the outcome, it would affect their children, their children's children, and generations to come. The building they entered was hardly a symbol of national permanence. The Capitol had been under almost constant repair. Its original timbers were rotting, its plaster was cracking, its wooden staircases were giving way. In the Senate wing, both the Supreme Court and the Circuit Court for the District of Columbia met in the basement. The din of brickwork and plastering rumbled through the, the stairwells and the lobby and the entrance halls. The exterior entrance to the Capitol was equally chaotic. There was a ramshackle set of wooden planks that joined both wings of the Capitol. Surveying this scene, Priscilla Queen and Mina Queen might have been confident that the scales of justice would tip in their favor. They had good reason to be optimistic. In the 1790s, 15 years earlier, their aunts and their uncles had won a series of freedom suits in the Maryland courts using much of the same evidence that they would present. One of them, Simon Queen, was now a free man. And he would take the stand and testify for them as a witness at their trial. The family's former attorney, Gabriel Duval, had risen to become an associate justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Duval had agreed to testify as a witness as well for them. Duval was one of the most prominent political figures in the city of Washington. And their lawyer was Francis Scott Key, an ambitious, well-connected attorney who had already made a name for himself in a major treason case and with many appearances already before the U.S. Supreme Court. But that was not all. They had a deposition that included the direct words of their ancestor, Mary Queen. She said, I was born free and lived in Guayaquil in New Spain. That's Ecuador today. And I was taken from there to London. Those words should have cinched their argument. But almost nothing about their case went as they expected. At the trial for their freedom, Mary Queen's words, the only words ever recorded from her, would not be heard in a U.S. court of law. And as we will see in a moment, researching the Queen Freedom Suits would lead me to reckon with what I did not know about my own family and its role in this story. Nearly a decade ago, I went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. to find out what I could about the Queen cases. I asked for the original case files of their freedom suits. The Supreme Court heard their appeal in a case titled Queen v. Hepburn. It's a widely cited decision that defined the hearsay rule in American law. All I knew was, what, was that the case originated as a freedom suit 
by an enslaved family and that Francis Scott Key was their attorney. I was intrigued. I began to wonder, what does it mean that the hearsay rule, something we see invoked often on TV in shows like Law and Order, as in objection, that's hearsay, was first defined in a case brought by an enslaved woman for her freedom. I did not know much about freedom suits. Dred Scott was one of the few I knew about. That case, decided in 1857, denied Scott his freedom and is notorious, infamous in American history because it held that blacks could not sue and had no rights under the Constitution. The very existence of the Queen Freedom Suits showed that slaves had sued in U.S. courts long before Dred Scott. To my surprise, there were hundreds of Freedom Suits in the files of the Washington, D.C. court. And the Queen case that went to the Supreme Court capped four generations of Freedom Petitions by the family in Maryland. Other families, the Shorters, the Mahoney's, the Butler's, the Thomas's, the Ducketts, and the Bell's filed dozens of freedom suits. Some did not succeed, but many did. Nearly half of the freedom suits were successful. These families were at the center of a story of American freedom and yet none of them appear in a history textbook. It seemed a glaring gap in our collective memory, a sobering reminder of the omission of some stories from our nation's history and the privileging of others. As I turned page after page in the vaulted reading room at the National Archives on Pennsylvania Avenue, It dawned on me that the freedom suits told a stunning story of resistance and described a desperate battle between enslaved families and slaveholders over the meaning of law, over the meaning of rights, over the meaning of freedom from the very moment of the nation's founding, even before. I set out to trace all of the freedom suits back in time and if possible, forward in time to the present to find the living descendants of those families who had sued for freedom. I traveled to Washington, D.C., Annapolis, Maryland, New Orleans, Louisiana, and London, England to conduct research, following the threads of the freedom suits wherever they led. I could track down these records thanks to support from the Guggenheim Foundation, support from the University of Nebraska, and support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I could compare these cases over time thanks to the amazing team at the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. They helped design and create a digital archive of all of the freedom suits ever filed in Washington, D.C., and their predecessor cases in Maryland. There have been many people who contributed to this research, too many to name here, but I do want to say that the team at the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities is unmatched, among the best in the world, and I am profoundly grateful for their collaboration. Graduate students and undergraduate students here at the University of Nebraska and at other institutions have also made enormous contributions to this research. The center's success, evident across many interdisciplinary projects, comes, I think, from the extraordinary spirit of dedication of the professional staff and the faculty and the students here at Nebraska. You can see all of the Freedom Suits at our website, earlywashingtondc.org. The project is ongoing. This week, we are releasing 151 Freedom Suit cases filed by the Butler family against the leading slaveholders of Maryland. 
The digital archive was the first step in repairing the gaps, the silences in the documentary record. With the help of the center's staff and students, we connected the Queen Freedom Suits over several decades and all of the other freedom suits we could find in the case files held at the National Archives. Tracing every relationship in these records, we could reconstruct the genealogies of these families and the network of witnesses, neighbors, jurors, and slaveholders involved in each of these lawsuits. The story begins in Prince George's County, Maryland, one of the wealthiest black majority counties in the United States today. At the nation's founding, it held more than 60% of its total population in bondage. In May 1789, the same month that the first U.S. Congress was meeting in New York, a small group of Jesuit priests met for their annual business meeting at a plantation they called White Marsh. The Jesuits held more than 90 people in slavery at White Marsh. They had five other plantations in Maryland, totaling some 11,000 acres. They enslaved more than 1,400 men, women, and children over the decades. The Jesuits decided at their May 1789 meeting to use the proceeds from their plantations to found a college at Georgetown. They also resolved, for the first time, to start systematically selling those enslaved people they deemed too old to work. Edward Queen was 35 years old. His mother, Phyllis, was in her 70s. Charles Mahoney was 34. His aunts and uncles were older. And Edward Queen and Charles Mahoney sued the Reverend John Ashton as the defendant slaveholder in October 1791. He was the Jesuit priest who personally oversaw White Marsh as its manager. He also represented the Jesuit private trust that held the enslaved families as a collective property. It was an entity that would soon be called the Corporation of Roman Catholic Clergymen in Maryland. A stunning contest unfolded in Maryland and Washington, D.C. as a result of these two cases, Queen v. Ashton and Mahoney v. Ashton, challenging the very basis of slavery in American law. Charles Mahoney's case took 11 years, three jury trials, two appeals before it was finally over. In its length and complexity, Mahoney v. Ashton was like almost no other freedom suit in American history. It spanned the entire 1790s. And it turned on whether Mahoney's black ancestor came from England to Maryland as an indentured servant. And therefore, on whether something called the Somerset Principle in English law made her a free person by definition because she had set foot on English soil where under the Somerset principle, slavery was not legally sanctioned. If either or both of these families succeeded, hundreds of relatives could gain their freedom, whether they lived on the Jesuit plantations or not. Potentially, dozens of slaveholders across Maryland would be affected. Edward Queen won his freedom suit in May 1794. And in response, slaveholders across Maryland clamped down. Some of the Queens lost their cases. And 15 years later, Priscilla Queen and Mina Queen would make the same argument that Edward Queen did. But they had that deposition 
that deposition with Mary Queen's words in it. It was taken after Edward Queen's trial. A white man had testified that he knew Mary Queen, and she told him she was taken from New Spain to London by Captain Woods Rogers, whose raiding voyage was one of the most famous in English history. Because Rogers, after all, had picked up a man named Alexander Selkirk, whose story, Daniel Defoe, the novelist, would turn into Robinson Crusoe. The stakes were momentous. If the queens could prove that their ancestor set foot in England, especially if they could prove that she came to Maryland to the colony before 1715, when the colony passed its first slave code, then they might be able to use the English precedents that had declared slavery unlawful. What if the D.C. court acknowledged those precedents? When Priscilla and Mina Queen's freedom suit went to trial, however, the judges never let the matter get that far. They dismissed Mary Queen's words as hearsay, secondhand testimony, pronouncing a rule, the hearsay rule, so new that Francis Scott Key did not know how to react. and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the slaveholders. Priscilla and Mina Queen remained enslaved, and so did their children. Early in this research, I found evidence that some of my principal ancestors, the Ducats from Prince George's County, were closely connected to these events. I knew they were lawyers and judges and slaveholders. I did not know that one of the ducats was a judge in the county court and that he presided on the day when more than 20 Queen family members, including Edward Queen's mother, Phyllis, won their freedom. He allowed the hearsay evidence in the Queen cases into his courtroom. It was one of the largest single emancipations in a trial that I found in the archival records of Maryland. But I, did all, I also did not know that his ambitious son got his start as a young lawyer representing the Jesuits against the Queens in some of their freedom suits. And the Ducats, I found out later, enslaved some of the last queens held in Maryland in bondage. The deeper I dug into the archives, the more the parallel file on my family's history came into view, and the more I saw their actions through the lens of another family. As the full extent of their involvement became apparent, I realized I would need to confront the meaning of this history in a more personal, direct, and different way. A Question of Freedom, the book that I've written, is the story of what became the longest and the most complex legal challenge to slavery in American history. It came from Edward Queen and Charles Mahoney and Phyllis Queen, and Mina and Priscilla Queen, and many others. It is also a story about the deep moral hazard of American slavery, about the contradictory impulses of people like my Ducat ancestors, and people like Francis Scott Key. Key represented more than a hundred enslaved families in freedom suits. But he also defended slavery on racist grounds and eventually disparaged black freedom in all forms. And so this story is also one of acknowledging the full history of American slavery and working to repair what we have not acknowledged 
about our nation's history and its founding. I was left with profound questions about Queen V. Hepburn and its historic miscarriage of justice. Was it possible centuries later to verify the oral testimony in the Queen depositions that had been disallowed as inadmissible hearsay? Did the remnants of Mary Queen's story make it through the generations? A story of her freedom, did it get passed down to her descendants today? Each piece of Mary Queen's story was like a single chain in a link of evidence. We can imagine Mary Queen telling the stories of her freedom, a series of facts about her life over and over and over again. Repeating the essential parts, the nuggets, to connect the chain of evidence that she hoped would be passed on through the generations and possibly might be heard in a court. We will be joined in a moment by Melisande Short Cullum, a queen descendant of the Maryland family that was sold by the Jesuits in 1838 to Louisiana sugar planters to fund the college at Georgetown. In April 2017, I went to New Orleans to find out if Mary Queen's words had been passed down through the generations, words that had been expunged by the Supreme Court decision in Queen v. Hepburn. And I met Melisande Short Cullum in New Orleans. Melisande, it's wonderful to see you again. Oh, well, Welcome. It's, thank you thank so you much. For <laughs> What does the history of your Maryland Queen family mean to you? When we met in New Orleans, you told me a story that I'll never forget about your uh, grandmother telling you about the Maryland family. Can you, can you share with us that story? Oh, well, I grew up, um, and I've come to so, over the last three years since I've come to Georgetown, since we've met, I've come to a much deeper understanding of the stories that I grew up with from my grandmother's childhood and understanding what those stories meant to her in her life and, and what that meant to me. And I am one of my grandmother's 10 grandchildren. Um, so all of us, I have, I have four girl first cousins and I have six boy first cousins and all of us in our ways got this story from our grandmother. But I was the person, I'm the person who's sort of bringing it forward to you, which was bringing it back really to us. So my grandmother, I grew up hearing stories of my grandmother's life in the country with her family. She was, um, she was her mama's first child. She was born into a family um, that had been enslaved. Her grandmother, um, Eve Mahoney, was born into slavery in 1856. Her grandmother, uh, her great-grandmother, Mary Ellen Queen had been born in Maryland. Um, and my grandmother was born into a house and into a family that was inhabited by young people in 1838 who were part of the Georgetown sale. So the old people in her family, when she was born in 1896, were young people in 1838. So she grew up in a family of people who shared 
their childhood stories and talked about being enslaved because this was the life they lived. There was no running from it or hiding it or acting like it didn't happen. Um, so I, I grew up hearing stories of, from my grandmother's childhood about her family in Maryland, um, about their um, being so, coming to Louisiana as free people, people who had been freed in Maryland and coming from a family that had been manumitted and gone to court and that Francis Scott Key was the family lawyer. It's a great story. And when you and I met that March in New Orleans and we sat down not knowing one another and you were asking for information uh, from descendants of what they had heard in their families, I shared with you a, a 300 year remnant of my family's story that continued through displacement, separation from family, and 180 years of disconnection. At one point in our conversation, you, you turned to me and uh, you said, our ancestors are calling our names. I've never forgotten that moment. What, what, did you, what did you mean? What were you saying? I think, I feel, I am here as a representative of my family and families like mine, uh, the families you write about um, in your book. And this has always been part of our American history, part of our economic history, our legal history, our medical history, our labor history, our freedom history as Americans that has not been, and I, I won't use the word convenient because it was not convenient it was the deliberate decision to leave out very important players in the American story for the people to know who these builders are. There's this saying, you know, the 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 stone that the the the, the stone that the builders rejected. Well, we are not that stone. We are the builders. And the stones don't know who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Melly. That was, that was wonderful. After meeting Melisande and the other queen descendants in New Orleans, I could see that we would need new ways to bring these stories to life. By this time, dozens of descendants of the families who sued for freedom had contacted our center at Nebraska as they reconstructed family genealogies. The website hosted here, earlywashingtondc.org, has been accessed 1.4 million times in the first six months of 2020. In 2019, the site had 2.4 million hits and more than 25,000 unique visitors. Encouraged by Melisande and other members of the Queen family, especially Letitia Clark and Guilford Queen, we hosted an exhibit booth at the annual Queen family reunion in Queenstown, Maryland. This was in July of 2018 we compiled lists of the freedom suits by the principal families who sued for freedom and shared those with family members at the Queen Family Reunion at Queenstown so that they could track down the original records if they wanted to in the Maryland archives. 
But how could we hear the testimony of Mary Queen or other uh, freedom seekers? How could we hear that testimony directly? How could we repair the narrative of a family that had been silenced in history? We needed a form of history that was animated with real people, real stories, real voices. I turned to my colleagues in other disciplines for help right here at the University of Nebraska. Michael Burton, a visual effects artist and animator in textiles, and Joaquito Dreher, screenwriter, director, professor of African American literature here in English. And together we formed a partnership to use all of the available evidence from the archives and from oral history to create dramatic documentaries of the situations that the Queens and other families experienced. With support from the Office of Research, we produced an 11 minute live action animated short film about Ann Williams, whose freedom suit was one of the defining moments in American history. And we are currently producing a feature length, live action, animated film called The Bell Affair, about the Bell family's quest for freedom in Washington, D.C. Over 40 actors are in the cast. Production companies in New York and Los Angeles, led by alumni of the University of Nebraska, are working with us. We are building 3D models to recreate the cityscape of Washington, D.C. before the Civil War. Places like the Navy Yard, the U.S. Capitol, and Lafayette Square. The central premise of our collaborative and creative research is that our narrative of the nation's founding needs to include the stories of particular families. The national imagination still sees slavery as some kind of aberration, a detour from the true story of the nation's founding. And in that view, enslaved families remain largely nameless and faceless victims of a long ago system since disappeared. But this needs to change. Their descendants, their histories, their families live. And until we reckon with this history more widely, Americans will continue to live in separate spheres of historical understanding. That's a condition that more than anything, limits our ability to come to terms with the past. And in such a situation, we need to hear the words of Mary Queen and so many others. 
We cannot, of course, do anything to change what happened long ago. But we can change the way we understand what happened and what it means to us today in the present. Thank you for listening and watching.